Thank you, sir, and uh, Mr. Jayakumar for the introduction. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The National Flight Test Center is proud to have flown the 2030 on the light combat aircraft the day before yesterday. We look forward to continuing flying at even greater space and greater pace, and really uh, being able to hand over an operational aircraft to the Indian Air Force in the quickest possible time. Okay, now this program was conceived in the mid 1980s. What was the situation then? Decades of hiatus in uh, aeronautical design and development arena had resulted in uh, building up of huge technology gaps in our ability to provide a state-of-the-art aircraft to the armed forces. Probably all stakeholders not, uh, were not uh, very confident that this gap could be bridged. Initial focus, therefore, remained on creation of a viable flying machine. In this process, however, the essentials of designing a viable we weapon platform did not get the deserved attention. Also, many external factors affected the pace of the program. In recent times, however, India's emergence as an economic power and the imperatives of possessing indigenous defense capabilities had added credence to this program, and a viable weapon platform is on the threshold of entering squadron service. LCA is the biggest and unparalleled success story so far in the Indian aeronautics. Indisputable high-technology success stories within this program have been state-of-the-art quadruple redundant digital fly-by-wire control technology as evidenced by excellent flying qualities and high reliability, open architecture computer-based core avionic suite, microprocessor-based utility systems management, and a modern glass cockpit incorporating excellent pilot vehicle interface features. These key technologies will facilitate seamless upgradation and almost obviate obsolescence. We will no longer have to mimic other weapons, for example, when integrating them on this aircraft. The aim of my talk, however, is not to dwell on these success stories, but to do an honest assessment of the way this country has gone about developing this aircraft. I strongly believe that one of the greatest strengths of Western nations has been their ability to honestly and transparently assess their indigenous programs. Brutally frank assessments have resulted in quick and viable remedial action. The way we have gone about in this program has significant lessons for our future. As the future of aeronautics in this country in, in, is inextricably linked to the success of this program, it is vitally important that these lessons are imbibed in order to move forward coherently in building a strong aeronautics industry in this country. I am not going to be judgmental. I'm not, I don't intend to be judgmental on people who have taken decisions at different points in time because obviously I was not in their seats. They must have had their good reasons. A lot of what I'm going to say is hindsight. So what are the challenges that we face? A fundamental challenge in this program has been the structure of the Indian higher defense management, in my opinion. Broadly speaking, there are three verticals within the Indian Ministry of Defense that steer this program. There, uh, one is such vertical is headed by a warfighter, that is the Indian Air Force. Another by a bureaucrat, that is the Department of Defense Production, headed by Secretary of Defense Production. And the third by a technocrat, that is the Department of R&D. In this totally state-funded and state-managed program, interdepartmental oversight has been lacking. You will get a better insight as I progress. A possible solution could lie in an informed and responsible political entity taking direct charge of such projects to attribute responsibility and demand accountability in a way that is far more effective than the rather superficial political, political monitoring that goes on right now. For example, could there be a uh, Rajya Raksha Mantri Air Force, that is uh, a Minister of State for Defense Air Force or Minister of State for Defense Navy, something like uh, the Secretary of the Air Force and the Secretary of the Navy in the United States, who are actually hands-on. Alternatively, could we have a Defense Capability Commission uh, formed under the PMO and function on the lines of the Space Commission and the Atomic Energy Commission? 
I read in the, read in the newspapers that uh, the DRDO is looking for uh, a defense technology commission. But as a warfighter, I would prefer a defense capability commission because as we have learned in this program, developing technology and developing capability are uh, require varied, uh, uh, it's a totally different ballgame. Such steps would provide a national political vision beyond funding for major projects like the light combat aircraft. Next, I come to the clarity on standards. The base document for development of the LCA is a beautifully crafted air staff requirement that was clearly ahead of, a time, uh, ahead of its time in 1985 and is relevant even today, nearly three decades later. This document primarily restricted itself to stating performance requirements. The ESR document, however, mandated the use of U U.S. military specifications and standards of the day as the guiding document for design. The relevant standards and specifications were to have been culled out by DRDO headquarters. Any concessions were to be sought from Indian Air Force headquarters. There is no evidence to show that a comprehensive process was followed. This apparent lapse has led to some of the challenges in design that we face today so close to deployment. For example, you may have heard in the paper recently that we had to be grounded for a couple of months to rectify a design flaw in the crew escape system. Had the process been thorough in the 80s, we would not have hit this bump. Come to the clarity on the part to certification. In many ways, this is the first fighter aircraft design and development program in India after a gap of about four decades. Design expertise from the old program of HF-24 was not available and moreover the LCA envisaged a quantum leap in technology. To the Indian certification agency therefore, this was learning in progress. The path to certification is evolving along with the aircraft. Even with a small dedicated team of certification authorities toiling hard to ensure robustness of hardware and software, the extent of analysis and testing required tended to be a little open-ended. Comprehensive documentation of the part to certification in this program will hugely benefit future programs. Agencies for design, development and support. The focus on what I am going to say here is not on the organizations but on the philosophy. The main design houses are ADA and ARDC of HAL. This is somewhat akin to asking Lockheed Martin and Boeing, to, uh, Boeing design houses to design one aircraft. Company philosophy, policies and human practice will complicate matters. The fighter aircraft is a single entity and has to be seamlessly supported through its lifetime. I believe that empowerment presently is diffused. For program like this, unless there is a unified design house under one head, the saga of inconvenient marriage would continue and adversely affect the product during its entire lifetime. Okay, now customer involvement. During the design and development phase itself, it is vital that comprehensive knowledge of aviation in general and military aviation in particular is made available to the program. Scientists and de design engineers do not have that knowledge. The Indian Air Force is the only repository of comprehensive military knowledge aviation and military aviation knowledge in this country. Either its expertise was not sought or it was denied. Also, we probably have the only aviation companies in the world that do not have aviators embedded into design teams. As a result, while the designers concentrated on getting the technology airborne, the design necessities of turning the aircraft into a maintainable, deployable and employable weapon platform were missed to a large extent. Originally a reluctant customer, the Indian Air Force involved itself sufficiently only after contracting for, this, for supply of the aircraft in 2006. It was late in the program and hundreds of requests for action had to be raised in order to retrieve the situation to some extent, but this led to time and cost overruns. In the process of transitioning from design and development to series production, limited or otherwise, an essential step is to undertake a formal comprehensive evaluation of the technology demonstrators. It is in this process that platform's uh, uh, testability and therefore maintainability and its suitability for deployment can be assessed and recommendations made for the required standard of preparation of series production aircraft. These are subsequently to be tried out in prototype vehicles and the series production aircraft which come out have to be of the 
of a deliverable standard. Having neglected to take this step, limited series production aircraft are worthy of remaining test aircraft only and SOP of series production aircraft continue to evolve. Secondly, we have gone ahead and built 10 prototype vehicles and limited series production vehicles for the, of the Air Force fighter version alone. With limited human and space resources, maintaining these vehicles have been a major challenge. No customer would be willing to accept obsolescent equipment at induction. Slow progress of the program coupled with rapid development in the field of electronics played its part in inefficient development of the avionics package on this aircraft. The initial focus on airframe and basic platform issues led to a delay in requirement generation and creation of mission-specific software modules. Staggered integration of various mission systems also precluded comprehensive global software development and allowed development effort to be frittered away in development of patches and modules catering only for immediate needs of the hour. Lack of operational requirements, expertise in design teams led to replicating the Mirage cockpit logic on the aircraft without exploiting the significantly advanced hardware architecture on this aircraft. For example, com compared to one CRT on the Mirage, we have seven glass surfaces. A major course correction had to be effected when the Indian Air Force finally got into the program and uh, the head of the avionics design team is here and I am glad to say that a totally reworked package has recently got airborne. Also lack of realistic evaluations in simulation tools meant that evaluation in most cases was carried out in the air for the first time leading to delays due to the requirement of even small fixes having to go through the complete clearance cycle. There are many challenges that we continue to face in the tra in transition from uh, design to manufacture. One is the necessity, of convert, necessity to convert frozen design drawings into production drawings, purportedly an elaborate process that has to be undertaken by dedicated integration teams. These have then to be cleared by the certification agency and followed diligently by the manufacturing con quality control agencies. Structured, systematic and comprehensive technology transfer is inescapable to ensure that production agencies are able to support the product while in service. We are still in the process of building infrastructure to meet the manufacturing tolerances, making available correct jigs, fixtures and tooling to meet drawing requirements, making available suitable calibrating equipment and training additional manpower. These challenges directly affect the quality of manufacture. Concurrent development of support systems is also vital and cannot be underestimated. What I mean is tools, testers and ground equipment. Designers have to understand that testers that they develop to enable the design process would be unsuitable for use by the warfighter. What is required are simple testers ruggedized to be deployable and employable in the field by young air warriors with limited education in order to establish serviceability of a platform to undertake a particular mission. Similarly, ground support equipment have to be suited well, be light and durable for easy employability and transportability. Such support is vital to deploy the aircraft quickly and repeatedly and thus exploit the inherent advantages of air power. Before the LCA can be deployed, it is obviously necessary that the users are adequately trained to maintain and operate this aircraft. For training to be effective, prior generation of deliverable documentation is essential. These documents will have to be upgraded and supported through the lifetime of the aircraft. Generation and sustenance of flight and maintenance publications is a major activity and deserves the creation of a separate technical documentation group. Designers' documents have to be culled down and adapted to the requirements of the maintenance manuals which are suited to the not so highly qualified maintenance crew. Information further culled from these and uh, adapted from these manuals when en enhanced by the addition of flight handling information translate into a set of flight manuals which are used by the A crew. Generation of documentation deliverable to the customer demands the presence of a cohesive and sustainable structure throughout the lifetime of the aircraft.
coming into simulators and uh, rigs it is important that maintenance and flight simulators are available to train the customer ground crew and air crew based on the contract between iaf and hal ada did develop maintenance simulators with the flight simulators however it was a strange story along with the contract for supply of aircraft funds were allocated by the government of india for a simulator to be built by hal on the build operate maintain basis this was a new concept and years were lost in deciding whether funding would be on the capital route or on the revenue route as a result in induction there would be no dedicated flight simulator available for use by the customer air crew the situation will be aggravated by the non availability of a trainer variant of the aircraft in the required time frame during the design process lack of representative integration test rigs was an impediment in unearthing problems before it went to the aircraft as i mentioned earlier these rigs will also be missed during the service life of the aircraft also since they would have eased the process of solving problems that came up in the field level of indigenization what has been achieved or what will be achieved would have a direct bearing on the continued availability of spares and cost at which these spares would be available during the lifetime of the aircraft several key technologies were developed as a result of the vision of a few individuals formation of the national control law team national wing team and the national flight test center for example have been major success stories and continue to contribute towards deployment and beyond development of the core avionics software and microprocessor based utility services management system software and so uh, and uh, hardware and software will ensure maintainability and seamless upgradeability during field service but have we done enough probably a national engine team a national radar team a national navigation team etc over an order efforts to indigenize the currently imported lrus must continue with crusader zeal last but not the least few words on program management it is inconceivable that a complex program of this nature of of this type can be run efficiently without the assistance of professional program managers who constantly advise the technical leadership this would avoid a large number of issues cropping up at random the thread being lost and the same issues cropping up again months later with little progress having been made critical path has to be continually identified and attended to cost and time overruns have to be tracked by professional program managers using powerful software <coughs> cutting edge program management with well defined carrot and stick policy seems to be the need of the hour only then can the customer be given a viable time frame for deployment to enable his planning process if he has to repeatedly throttle back he will lose interest and look for alternatives and that would be a tragedy for aeronautics in this country in conclusion ladies and gentlemen i would reiterate that tejas is a wonderful flying machine it will be contemporary when it is inducted a few months from now in both its capability and its avionics suit and weapons and more so weapons as far as the weapons are concerned in the foc time frame that's final operation clearance it deserved to be in squadron service however a long time ago that would have been possible had the highest levels of the indian political leadership articulated and actively pursued the vision of an indigenous state of the art fighter aircraft with armed forces laying down clear requirements and monitoring the process with r and d organizations executing the design and development process and with the industry ensuring quality manufacture my ardent hope is that such wisdom will dawn and aviation in india will scale greater heights thank you thank you very much uh, comrade mutana in time as i have planned uh, leaving about 5 uh, to 6 minutes for the discussions uh, an analysis totally from the uh, perspective of uh, you know and a first person and uh, has been associated with the program uh, we have to treat it as okay an analysis done by a person who has uh, more or less run through the entire history of the program and definitely there are quite a few of the issues or of, of the points okay which actually should be kept in mind when we work on the new programs 
Uh, that's how I see the spirit of this analysis. Yes, what uh, what has not been done uh, efficiently because of lack of having the legacy of having such uh, programs in place. Probably I think this is a thesis that uh, the youngsters can take and also the senior managers take in a different way. Youngsters as a technology, senior managers as a management uh, analysis and should be able to uh, take this into consideration. Uh, not to make the same mistakes again is a very important thing. Uh, we can have a few discussion points with their Commodore Muthana. <coughs> yes, please. Is there one more? Of which? Okay. Jeb Kumar, just can you pass it on before we lose time? Is it on? Okay. Please identify yourself and then ask the question. So, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Lean Plus, okay, manufacturing that needs to be improved out of the Lean Plus process. Uh, uh, what are sorry, the next say that steps? again, please. You mentioned about the Lean manufacturing, the Lean Plus process that needs to be implemented for LCA or uh, uh, you had implemented something that oh it's not no no i did not talk about any lean process okay so yeah oh that's fine so are you planning to introduce any lean plus in the future <laughs> no i if there's any expert from hl over here <laughs> i would request them to answer that uh, no that was a lean mean fighting machine as somebody uh, assisted me <laughs> Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, I am Group Captain uh, Sudhir Verma, retired uh, in SAP Technologies. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, national, various national centers which should be there as per you. Uh, if you start, suppose we had national center for engine, for airframe, for avionics, everything, there will be so many national centers, then you will need a national center to manage all those national centers. I mean, uh, ADA, I think, was created to manage the whole program through different labs of DRDO and HAL and Air Force. So could you just uh, throw yeah. more light on what you meant, actually? When ADA was formed, as I understand, it was formed basically as a body to manage this project. Not They were not meant to be designers as such. They were meant to garner the expertise that is available in the country and, uh, you know, uh, manufacture the subsystems and thereafter the aircraft. Yes, they did this to a certain extent, you know, that is why uh, we have a full, I mean, this aircraft, a very, very large percentage of it is uh, composites, for example. Okay, the wing design, the control law design, it is world-class engineering, there is no doubt about it. Okay, now these all have come about for, because <coughs> expertise from all various labs in the country, universities in the country were put together to produce this level of excellence. Okay, now I talked about these verticals. For example, uh, Dr. Chetty's NAL is not uh, any part of this vertical. They are a different ministry altogether. But their expertise was garnered. Was there something like that necessary for the for the major equipment that are not yet indigenous today, like the engine and the radar and things like that? Why is it that we are continuing to fly with foreign equipment? Could we have something uh, done, something better? Could we, uh, should we have, for example... Uh, you know, got expertise from all over. I'm sure there are there's brilliance in this country. It is just that we have to learn to uh, put uh, get our act together. Could we should we have got our act together to make an uh, make a radar ourselves, make an engine ourselves? Is something we need to ponder over because there have been success stories in certain areas. Old. Okay, I would like to supplement the centers of excellence uh, which were created in the program. There's a national team for the wing national team for the control law team and uh, the place where he is working itself is a national team and all these people have done exceedingly well there is absolutely no problem uh, for a body like ADA to coordinate and uh, probably I think if we take uh, the views expressed by the speaker uh, some center of excellence for the radar 
I am sure we will be able to have our own radar in some time. And of course, engine is going to happen the way he has uh, dreamt. Thank you very much.